So Caroline Lucas has represented Brighton Pavilion for 13 years as the only Green MP in the country. Now, very recently, she announced that she won't be seeking re-election at the next general election, and therefore the Greens are looking for a new candidate. Three people have put their names forward for the selection, and I'm going to be speaking to one of the candidates today. Members of Brighton Hove Green Party will be choosing from that list of three, and by mid-July, we'll know who the next parliamentary candidate for Brighton Pavilion will be, and very likely also the next Green MP. So as I said, I'm going to be joined by one of those for a conversation just now. But before I introduce them and we get going, I have one thing to ask for you all to do, which is to scroll down right now and hit subscribe. So without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by the first of the three candidates in the selection, Emily O'Brien. Emily, how are you doing? I'm very good, Chris. Yeah, very excited to be here. Thank you. Well, it's brilliant to have you and we'll kick off nice and straightforwardly. Um, can you tell our viewers why you're standing to be the Green Party's next candidate for Brighton Pavilion? Of course, yeah. I mean, I think the first thing I have to do, though, is just to really pay tribute to Caroline Lucas. Um, she is absolutely amazing. She's been a personal inspiration to me and to so many of us in the Green Party and indeed outside of the Green Party. So she is just this most enormous pair of green shoes to fill. Um, and I think, you know, that uh, it's, it's an honour to even be on a list in that role, along with two other great candidates. Um, but in terms of why I put my name forward, um, the, the very first reason is actually because other people asked me to. Um, I've obviously, uh, I moved to Brighton and Hove in 1999. I brought three kids up there and I've been really at the heart of some, you know, really well-respected partnership work in there, tackling some of the issues in the city. So I know a lot of people there. I'm very well networked and known. I have a good local reputation. And in fact, the work I did there has a national reputation as well. So uh, I have to say, it wasn't the first thing that came in my head. It's a little bit like Wonder Woman's just handing in her notice. Um, I wouldn't think to put myself forward for Wonder Woman. And I think it was when I got to about the 15th person who, who rang me up and said, you have to do this, that I actually put my name in the ring. So um, uh, so it is, it is daunting, but it's also a tremendous opportunity, I think. Um, I think the other reason why I'm putting my name forward is because I'm just really aware this isn't in a sense, um, the safe seat that it is on paper. Uh, we have a huge majority for that seat. It's, I understand it's the biggest majority for uh, outside of Conservative and Labour for any seat in the last election. So that's a massive majority on paper. But obviously, I'm really aware that a lot of that is Caroline's personal vote. Um, so there is a lot of hard work to do, a lot of door knocking, a lot of fundraising, a lot of just back to basics, you know, really connecting with voters. And there's not that long, really, with just over a year to build a strong local profile. So I suppose, you know, what, the reason why I'm sort of putting my hat in the ring is because I already have a strong local profile. So I feel, you know, I can bring that to the role. But also I have just by coincidence, really, quite recently, rearranged my life to give 100% commitment to my roles as a councillor and, and for the National Green Party. Um, so I feel I'm kind of in a position to offer the hard work that that job needs. So you talked there quite a bit about your, I guess, local links to <clears throat> Brighton. Mm. Am I right in thinking that you're currently based in Lewis, where you're a councillor? Yeah, I live um, in Lewis District, so it's not um, it's confusing because we have Lewis Town and Lewis District. So I don't I don't live in the town of Lewis. I live just outside New Haven, so it's not that far from Brighton. It's um, you know it's a few miles. I manage to cycle in on my electric bike regularly for work, um, but I do so I sort of have a bit of a dual identity really because we moved. So I moved to Brighton in 1999, and then in 2016 moved out to where I am now, just outside New Haven. But my kids have continued through the school system in Brighton. I've continued to work in Brighton. Um, so I've had I've kind of had a, a foot in both camps the whole time, um, although obviously my sort of political identity has been much more associated with Lewis uh, and my kind of professional identity has been much more associated with Brighton, I guess. Um, and it's actually quite exciting for me to kind of look at bringing those two things together, because, you know, in Lewis, we've we've been doing incredibly well. I'm a senior council there. We just smashed it in local elections. We uh, eliminated conservatives from being the largest party to zero. Um, you know, so it's kind of an exci exciting opportunity to look at bringing those those different aspects of my life together. And so I guess you, you've talked there about being uh, sort of between those two council areas and you talked there about the Lewis District Council election results. Now, 
you're right. In Lewis, uh, the Tories were ousted from the council and it was a brilliant set of results for the Greens. In Brighton Hove, the picture was very, very different and the Greens lost control of the council and um, lost half their seats. So obviously going into the next general election with uh, the Brighton Brian Pavilion constituency in mind against the backdrop of those council election results, what do you think the lessons the Greens need to learn about uh, what happened in those Brighton Hove elections last year are? Well, I think it's it's like anything, isn't it? Local elections and, and um, national elections are really different. Um, so we can't always read one from the other. But I think what we have to recognise is obviously we need to learn any lessons that there are to be learned from the Brighton results. Um, and I think that's where my sort of back to basics thing comes in. Actually, what we need to do is we need to re rebuild our data, make sure we, we really are understanding our voters um, and, you know, wh where they're inclined towards. We do need to do a lot of connecting with people on the doorstep. Um, and that's going to be so important, I think, for, for this, you know, uh, general election. Having said that, I think, you know, politics is, is a strange thing, isn't it? So Brighton and Hove Council, I, I know this because I've, I've worked in, you know, in partnership roles that have required kind of council support, you know, for many years. It's, it's like a yo-yo. It swings backwards and forwards and whoever is in tends to bear the brunt. Um, and I think, you know, that that is going to work in our favour, really. I mean, we have to remember that the Greens were only holding the administration in Brighton because Labour weren't able to maintain an administration. Their, their party sort of basically imploded and they weren't able to stay in power, even though they were the biggest party. Um, so I think, you know, that's kind of, you know, that's that's an important story in itself. Um, and I think the main thing, you know, is to be really forward looking. Um, I think in terms of national elections, obviously, I think Caroline's legacy of just being hugely influential and hugely liked um, is going to really play in the Greens favour. And I also think the other thing that will appeal to Brighton and Hove residents is the fact that, um, you know, in a sense, what we all need, it's very likely to be a Labour government going forward, no matter who's, who comes in in Brighton Pavilion. But what we really need is, is a candidate who will hold Labour's feet to the fire. Um, Brighton and Hove is a progressive place. I know a lot of people who are Labour Party members there who've always voted for Caroline. And some of that is actually because we really, you know, as, in Brighton and Hove, we really like to, 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 to we're, we're really willing to think a bit differently, to go out on a limb. And we're going to be much more inclined towards the more progressive policies of the Greens than towards some of the Labour policies and some of the kind of recent backtracking they've done on various things I think isn't going to play well with our electorate. Um, so I do think you know the picture for the general election is very different from the local election but as with anything it's just so important to learn the lessons and also to sort of rebuild and, and regroup you know this is this is a new thing going forward and it's actually really exciting because there's not only going to be a new um, potential Green MP in Brighton and Hove but actually that's part of a cohort of Green MPs I mean it's so likely we'll have a Green MP in Bristol I can't I can't see that not happening and also potentially you know Suffolk, Herefordshire it's going to be a kind of new era where we're not just Caroline on her own. It's a group of new MPs. So you talked there about holding Labour's feet to the fire and I guess the kind of political landscape at the moment. Um, so let's talk about politics then uh, rather than the next election. So if you were to become the candidate uh, for Brighton Pavilion and to become the next Green MP, what would your political priorities be uh, in that role? Well, in a sense, you're kind of asking that at the wrong stage of the process, because actually my my role is is to get elected my role or whoever is selected as a candidate. The first thing to do is to get elected. Um, and part of that being elected is to develop messages as part of a team. It's not just up to the candidate what our messages are. And so I, you know, in a sense, you're kind of anticipating, but I do think um, I have to say I'm very proud of a lot of our green policies and I think it's likely that those will resonate with our with our green voters, with our um, Caroline voters, you could call them. I think particularly, um, obviously, the climate and nature emergencies are going to be absolutely key, uh, that that problem is not going away, is it? It's escalating. And we have a, a very aware kind of bunch of people in Brighton who and Hove who are really, you know, concerned about those things and, and things like, you know, um, you know, kind of the government's inaction on those and Labour's recent backtracking as well on things like the 28 billion that should have gone into the green jobs of, and green investment for the future. 
isn't going to play out well on those. So I think I think um, the, you know the climate and nature emergency is the other thing that I think is going to be really important. And again, just to stress, you know this this is something we need to test. This is something that we need to to agree on as a group. But the other thing that I think is just really important is public services. I mean, obviously, although I'm a couple of miles outside Brighton, we share all the same public services. Um, you know, and just thinking about, you know, what I've been through recently with my mum in adult social care in Hove. She um, she lives in Hove with my daughter and, you know, children's mental health services, which have been just awful. I mean, just the fact that the hospital, I mean, going to A&E in our local hospital is just awful. And I think some of those kind of sense of just, it just, just sometimes feels like our public services are falling apart around us, some of those nationally run public services, uh, health and things like that. So, um, I, you know, I do think there'll be something around that will resonate around our green policies, which really are taking such a different approach to, uh, to what our, our public services should be. And so in terms of the MP for Brighton Pavilion, Caroline Lucas currently, she has, for a number of reasons, been the kind of most identifiable figure with the Green Party. Partially it's because she was leader for a number of years. Partially it's because, you know, she's such an effective communicator and is good in media gigs and so on. But partially it's because she is the Green sole MP. And therefore, whoever replaces her, if the Greens hold Brighton Pavilion, is going to be one of the most high profile Greens in the country, the public figure that most people are likely to uh, think of first when they think of the Green Party. The journalists will ring up when they want a quote or a interview. How do you think you are well placed to take that role on in addition to all the other things that are required <laughs> of being an MP? Well, I think, you know, again, just to pay tribute to Caroline Lucas, she's been holding a lot on her shoulders, hasn't she? But I am really confident that the, we will have a group of MPs going forward and some of that some of that will be shared out. And, you know, I, I, I absolutely feel it in my bones. I think the kind of what I hear um, and our recent local election successes, you know, we now have well over 700 councillors. Um, those, I think that kind of the way that we've broken through in terms of credibility does mean that will happen. But having said that, obviously, you know, it, it is a big role. Um, I've, I've weirdly, I've, I've only really come to, I, I was always a, me a member of the Green Party and I used to deliver a local council's, councillor's newsletter when I was living in Brighton. But, um, you know, whenever, I, I, I never stood as a councillor myself and I wasn't particularly involved in the party. And um, one of my reasons for that was because I was doing this kind of cross city work there that was required cross party support. I was absolutely no, I can't possibly have a political identity. I need cross party support. And actually, that was where my focus was, was around doing that stuff. Um, so but actually, it's only so it's only really since I moved slightly away and it's only, you know, around the corner. But since I've been away and been able to not um, mix those two roles up that I've I've um, stood for election. And actually, do you know what? I've, I really love it. And I. I think I felt tremendous frustration with some of the kind of work that I've done, even though it's been nationally acclaimed as, you know, we've really done everything we can as a city around food poverty, around food systems. But actually, when it comes to it, the answers lie in a set of national policy decisions. And I'm I'm really interested to to be the person who people can come to on some of those. And I think it helps that I've come from as much a background concerned around sort of social justice as environmental justice. I've done a lot of different jobs over the years um, and I genuinely care about things like public services as well as things like um, climate and nature, which is, you know, obviously my, my role as a senior counsel at the minute is I, I am the lead on climate and nature. So it's it's those things are absolutely intrinsic to me as with most Greens. But I do have that kind of, I do have that very broad interest um, I think the other thing as well is just to say, actually, any MP is part of a team. The MP is the person you see. They're like the kind of pinnacle, aren't they, in the triangle? But actually, there is a big team of people underneath them. And I think one of the skills is around working well as a team. And that's something that I would bring to that role. So, you know, Caroline has a fantastic parliamentary team as well, um, because it's also really important to be a good MP. You know, we always think about Caroline as you know, it's almost like this selection is something that's owned by the National Party, but actually she's a local MP and they're for, for local people. And as Greens, we have to be that bit better at looking after our local residents. We have to answer every email. We have to pick up every bit of casework. 
Um, and I think, you know, that side of things is, is also really, really important. And it's something that I'm good at. I, I like connecting with people. Um, I like working as a team. So obviously, you know, as an MP, you, you can't answer every email on your own. You need you need that team doing it with you. Um, so whether that's on kind of, you know, the really big things, the kind of the national policy stuff, um, I'm really excited for that. But also those kind of smaller things as well, you know, the connecting with people, the dealing with people's problems. Um, I, I really enjoy that stuff. Um, so I haven't I haven't entirely answered your question, but what I've said is I think it's it's almost not quite the right question because A, because we're going to have a team and B, because we also need to remember that this role is is one of, of a local MP and to keep this seat green, which is we absolutely have to. We have to make sure that we're resonating with those people on their issues. So I'm going to move on now um, to talk uh, hopefully to you about some of the kind of um, some of the discussions that I guess are happening in the Green Party at the moment. The reason why I wanted to put some of these questions to you is because members in Brighton and Hove will, when they're casting their ballot in this election, will want to know mm. the candidates' views on a range of different issues, um, I guess, that have, have been somewhat controversial within the party. Um, and so the first thing I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, and I guess this this in some ways crosses over with your brief as a spokesperson right now, um, which is one of the areas that's been particularly controversial in recent years has been HS2. Mm. And I wonder if you could let uh, our viewers know what your thoughts are on HS2. Well, I think, you know, I'm I'm fully um, on board with Green Party policy on just about everything. Um, I'm, and I think, you know, in terms of going into the details of HS2, I think I, I don't think that's my role as a candidate in Brighton and Hove to be commenting on that at this stage. I think we have that conversation after I've been selected as or who, you know, you have it with whichever candidate is selected. But I am, you know, I, there, there are no, I think just to answer more broadly, though, there are no areas of green policy that I'm in disagreement with. I, I really do think. And it's sort of what keeps me keeps me motivated as well. You know, every now and then, sometimes it's hard, isn't it? You know, being with such sometimes we we have such big ambitions as a party. We try so hard, and as a you know, even a, as a councillor and senior councillor, I put so much into it. And sometimes you kind of you get a little bit kind of weary. But actually, I think you know our kind of Green Party policy is what what brings me back in the end. One of the other areas of policy that's been slightly contentious mm. recently within the Green Party is around the party's policy on NATO. So for mm. viewers who don't know. The Green Party used to support a policy of Britain withdrawing from NATO. That's now changed. So the party now supports policy of reform of NATO and continued membership. Um, the arguments put forward for that were around the change in global context around the war in the Ukraine. Now, a lot of other people have criticised it for, you know, uh, the Green Party now supporting membership of a nuclear alliance. Um, mm. This is going to continue to be contentious going forward. So what's your kind of position on, on that policy? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, because I think you've summarised it beautifully, isn't it? It's, it's one of those really difficult discussions and there isn't an easy answer one way or the other. Um, I do think I do support that decision and not least because it is the decision of conference. And actually, you know, it is really important that that we stand up for for our, our way of, we make decisions as Greens. Um, and I do think, you know, the war in Ukraine has been such an important factor in that Um so I would say, you know, I support that, but I also, I wouldn't say that I would, um, you know, my thinking is is completely defined in a hard line on that. What, I, what I'm what i aware of is, is how strong the arguments are on both sides. So in the last kind of uh, challenging policy area I wanted to, to talk about before I move on to my mm. uh, more flippant questions, which I like to end all these interviews with, um, is around trans rights and transphobia. Mm. Mm. So, um, I think it'd be difficult to be a member of the Green Party in recent years and to not have noticed uh, the kind of tensions mm. that have uh, that there have been around this issue. And I wanted to ask you, as I guess, if you become the MP for mm. Brian Pavilion, mm. you're you would be, as we've talked about, one of the the most high profile figures in the Green Party. Mm. Mm. Um, how would you use your position to to show leadership um, on tackling transphobia within the Green Party? Of course, yeah. I mean, and I, I should say as well, this is a really um, relevant question for Brighton and Hove as well, where we have such a large population of LGB, LGBTIQA um, plus people. Um, and, you know, it's really sort of, um, you know, a, a really important local issue as well as a national issue. Um, I'm really proud to be a Green Party member. And one of the things that makes me proud is our, our, our inclusive policies. And I would see my position being to uphold those. 
Um, I do think what it might be helpful, um, um, so just to be really clear, you know, I believe uh, trans men are men, trans women are women, and that non-binary people, that that is a completely valid identity. So I'm absolutely upfront that I support our policies on those. Um, I also think, though, it might be helpful as a party. I think we haven't kind of defined some of the edges around that. So, um, you, you know, I think it would what I'd really like to see as a party is, is some kind of listening exercise. I think, the, you know, the positions that I've come to have come from listening to people. I've talked about this quite a lot with younger people, I think, which is interesting. I feel very different view from younger people who are much more accepting of that line. And I think sometimes, particularly women in my generation, people who've grown up, I mean, I suppose, you know, I'm, I'm quite old and I, you know, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. And, I, you know, the kind of blatant sexism that was just part of my life that I think we all internalised may, has made us anxious about losing some of those rights. And I really do understand when pe people have concerns about those rights being threatened. And I think what would help would be to have some kind of listening exercise working group to work out where the edges are around those, because obviously there are exemptions um, under the Equalities Act, which, um, you know, are, are important. And I think sometimes it's not clear whether as a party we're upholding those exemptions or not. So I think it would be good to just have something that sets out the edges around our policy. And perhaps, uh, I, I mean, I think, you know, it's not, I, I think really that's something for the leadership of the party to be leading on. But obviously, as you say, it is a high profile role. Um, and I would see that as, as something that I would be really happy to lend some weight to, not least because it is also, you know, a very important um, local factor in Brighton and Hove with our population. So I promised I move on to the more flippant questions <laughs> and I have a few of them which I like to finish on. Um, the first one I've been told isn't actually that flippant, but I think it is. Um, so you talked earlier about uh, you being entirely comfortable with Green Party policies, but I wondered if you could tell us firstly what your favourite Green Party policy is and also if you can think of one, what your least favourite is. Oh, gosh, that's a really, um, that's not a flippant question, Chris. You need to get out more if that's your flippant question. I thought you were going to ask me what my favourite food was or something. Um, let's have a think. I mean, I think, you know, as a Green, I think what's inspired me and inspired many and what makes me think that we as a Green Party are the party for here and now are our policies around climate and around nature and you know the, the catastrophe that we're heading towards I think our really strong policies on those have to be have to be my favorite um, and I think the things that are increasingly resonating with our voters least favorite one I can't think of one that's really bad isn't it I'm gonna have to come back to you on that I'll uh, I'll have a think about that one that's totally fine that's always the one that catches people um so here's a more flippant one then what's your favorite pizza topping Oh, favourite pizza topping. Um, pro it's got to be plain. I think, you know, margarita is the only way with pizza. You've got to taste the pizza. You don't want to disguise it with pineapple or something. It's almost definitely the most controversial thing you've said thus far. Um, if you were <laughs> prime minister for just one day, what one thing would you change and you're only allowed one? Oh, um. I would make a carbon target move to 2030 with binding personal punishments for every MP who blocked anything to do with meeting that. That would be a great, well, a great power to have, wouldn't it? <laughs> My penultimate question for you is what book has most shaped your politics? Um, it would be a book called the half hour allotment, which I had as someone with an allotment many years ago. And it's, it's, um, I know, you know how permaculture is sometimes described as revolution disguised as organic gardening. And it's kind of, it's a book that is time management and change disguised as running an allotment. And it's, it's amazing. It's about how you can actually achieve a huge amount by just concentrating your input in the right places. And I'm saying that semi facetiously, but actually for me, that's what change is all about. You know, we have in big tasks in front of us, really major tasks, and we need to concentrate our efforts on the bits we can change and using the levers that we can, the things that have the most, most bang for the buck. 
so um so actually that is a you know a game-changing book and then finally for you uh the most difficult question of all who in the green party inspires you the most uh, it's got to be Caroline Lucas, hasn't it? Bringing it back to the beginning. And, you know, I'm only sorry she's not staying on, but I do thank her for everything she's done. And, you know, she will continue to be such a such an amazing beacon for everyone as part of our Green Party going forward. One excellent note to finish on, Emily. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you, Chris. It's been great. Thanks. So that was Emily O'Brien, one of the three candidates in the running to be the next parliamentary candidate for the Green Party for the Brighton Pavilion constituency. The other two candidates are Sean Berry and Daniel Rue, and we will be putting out interviews with those two candidates very, very soon. The best way that you can make sure that you don't miss those interviews is to hit subscribe. That means you'll get a notification when those videos go out. Before you run away, I just have a couple of final things to let you know and ask you to do. Um, so firstly, this, this interview, this video and all the content that Bright Green puts out is only possible because of the kind and generous support of our donors. If you are able to, please do head to our website bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation. We're not bankrolled by big business. We're not funded by billionaires. We can only do this with your support. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you very, very soon.